percentage of HPV types 16, 18, 31, 33, 35, 45, 52 and 58 um, as being the most high risk because they cause most of the, these cancers that um, you just saw. So it is um, certainly cervical cancer, any cancer is of major public health concern um, and certainly cancers of the anus, the penis, the vagina, the vulva are, are relatively uncommon cancers, but they are thought to be increasing, um, possibly due to increasing HPV transmission, uh, secondary to changes in sexual behaviour over the, the decades. There are some low risk HPV types and they are mainly associated with non-malignant lesions such as your genital wards. So HPV requires a breach in the epithelial surface in order to enter into those basal epithelial cells um, through endocytosis and then they cause infection. And evidence um, does suggest that HPV progresses successfully because it does not induce an immune system response for most of its life cycle. So it can just lay in there and the immune system doesn't pick it up as an infection. So most people will clear genital HPV infections. Um, that is the infections no longer detectable by HPV DNA testing within around about 12 to 24 months. However, in some cases, like I said, the virus is thought to just remain nice and latent. Um, and even though, you know, that DNA is no longer detectable, um, they can still be there. So in about three to 10% of HPV infections, the virus will persist and obviously um, increase that person's risk of developing um, an associated cancer. So most HPV infections have no symptoms whatsoever. The incubation period, so this is the time between becoming infected and developing symptoms if you were to experience any symptoms is around about two to three months with a range of anything from one to 20 months for genital warts. The infectious period, so this is the time where an infected person can infect another person. Um, this is actually unknown for HPV. Um, but for genital warts, it uh, is probably for at least as long as the visible uh, wart exists. Because there's no noticeable symptoms in many cases, um, it's obviously very, very difficult to diagnose. Obviously, if there's a, a, a wart, it's very obvious, people can see it and people can go and have it checked out and certainly can go and have it looked at. Obviously, there's HPV screening for women, which we will talk about a little bit later, um, but unfortunately, there's no real approved screening test for HPV in males. So certainly, if men are concerned, they really should be contacting their GP um, and discussing their concerns. So some of those high risk types of HPV, which are your type 16 and 18, for example, can take longer to clear from the body. And in some people, um, infection with these HPV types remains for a long time and therefore have risk of developing significant cell changes or dysplasia, which is a word you've probably heard before. Obviously, dysplasia can lead on to being an invasive cancer if it's not detected and treated early enough. So obviously, back in December 2017, the cervical screening test replaced the PAP test for screening for cervical cancer. Um, the PAP test used to look for cell changes in the cervix, whereas the cervical screening test that we currently do actually looks for HPV. 
So it's important that women do see their GP about this test. So we talked about these symptoms, um, if people get them. And unfortunately, the point when abnormal cells in the cervix bind together and form tumours, um, then cervical cancer symptoms may become, may become apparent. And obviously, there's a whole range of them here. But because many of these cervical cancer symptoms are, um, you know, sight unseen, realistically, unless you get to this stage, um, women really don't seek advice early enough in order to prevent this cancer or certainly stop it from developing. So HPV is most commonly transferred from person to person um, during vaginal or anal sex. And however, penetrative sex is not the only way that HPV is transmitted. It can be transmitted via skin-to-skin -skin contact during oral sex or other types of sexual activities. And a person with HPV can pass the infection to someone even when they have no signs or symptoms of having HPV infection themselves. So anyone who is sexually active can get HPV. Even if they have had sex with only one person on one occasion, um, but certainly the risk of acquiring a HPV infection increases with the number of sexual partners um, an individual has. Most of the time, a baby born to a woman with genital warts um, does not have HPV-related complications. But in very rare cases, a baby born to a woman who has genital warts at that time will develop warts in their throat. And this is a really serious respiratory condition um, called respiratory papillomatosis. And when a papilloma or a growth of papillomas grow in the larynx, it can obstruct the process of breathing and therefore the infant requires frequent laser surgery to prevent the warts from blocking its breathing passengers. Unfortunately, um, those papillomas will continue to return and therefore these babies will need to undergo this type of um, treatment multiple times. Um, in regards to so symptoms of um, papillomatosis is really a hoarseness in the baby's cry um, or a really quiet or weak cry. Obviously, airway obstruction can occur in really severe instances. So who is at risk? Well, as I said, HPV is so common and almost every sexually active person is going to get a HPV at some time if they don't get vaccinated. In 2018, um, the La Trobe University in Melbourne surveyed a, just a bit over 6,000 secondary students in years 10 to 12 um, across Australia and found that 47% of students have had sex. Now, if you're a parent of a teen right now, you're probably going to want to block your ears, bury your head in the sand and go, oh, it wouldn't be my lovely little daughter or it wouldn't be my gorgeous son. Um, bottom line is, this is really common activity for these teenagers. Um, obviously, the younger the, the teenager, um, the, the less risk that they have had some type of um, sexual activity. But the average age um, for the 47% that um, had admitted in the survey that uh, they had had sex, had experienced sexual intercourse um, around about 16 years of age. So biologically, there are some risk factors that we could look at. And the high prevalence of HPV um, among HIV infected women is thought to be due to the compromised immune system caused by the HIV infection. And this enables 
the HPV viral um, genome to be persistent um, and therefore increases that probability um, that they will have multiple HPVs uh, resulting in higher risks for progression to cervical neoplasia and which in turn might progress to um, cervical cancer. Obviously, um, age of first sexual um, intercourse in some studies has not really been related to HPV risk, but in other st studies, it has been. Um, age is a little bit of an, um, a factor um, just because it's one of the few biological-based factors that's associated with um, the risk of acquiring HPV infection because obviously the older somebody gets, the more likely are they are to engage in, in sexual activity. Um, genetic polymorphism is where there's an alteration in DNA sequence and usually um, this doesn't directly cause a disease, but rather it might serve as a predisposing factor. Um, and a, there's a, a large number of previous studies that have suggested that possible correlation between genetic polymorphisms of cancer susceptibility genes and the higher risk of human malignant tumours. Behaviourally based risk factors. Now, this is things that we can control ourselves because these are behaviours. Um, obviously, high risk sexual behaviour is the main risk factor associated uh, with acquiring HPV and certainly risking the persistence of that HPV infection. So several studies um, have really looked at the risk factors for genital HPV and particularly these high risk types and certainly the lifetime number of sexual partners. Having a new partner, um, maybe you're unsure of that partner's sexual history or maybe you are sure of that partner's sexual history, which could be quite extensive. Studies demonstrating cigarette smoking um, is associated with HPV load, HPV persistence, incidence, um, and prevalence. So this may be because ingredients of cigarette smoke have also been shown to modify the function of immune cells. So these um, toxins that are in cigarettes can cause DNA change and uh, therefore um, making somebody a lot more susceptible to infection, um, which could lead on, in this case, to a cancer. So if we're looking at the types of cancers, um, obviously, you know, the cervical cancer in females rates really quite high. The HPV and related diseases summary report in 2022 stated around 40% of oral pharyngeal cancers, which mainly comprises the tonsils and the base of the tongue as the sites reported in Australia were caused by HPV with HPV 16 being the most frequent type. This same report also states that current estimates indicate that globally every year there are 569,847 women diagnosed with cervical cancer and a little over half of them will die from that disease. So cervical cancer ranks as about the fourth most frequent cancer um, among women in the world. And obviously the first three being colon and rectal cancer, breast cancer and lung cancer. So Australia has one of the lowest rates of cervical cancer mortality, which is very, very good to see. Um, but of the 300, for the 328 women um, that died, um, there are way too many deaths. So according to Cancer Australia in 2021, it's estimated that a female has a one in 663 risk of dying from cervical cancer by the age of 85. And, you know, cervical cancer is one of the most preventable and treatable forms of cancer. 
So continued participation in that national cervix um, screening program, as well as vaccination of girls and boys against HPV through the National HPV Immunisation Program is absolutely vital um, to ensure that elimination of cervical cancer as a public health problem is achieved. As I said before, there are many, many types of HPVs. Um, of the 40 known mucosal HPV types, HPV 16 and 18 are the most common causes of HPV-associated cancers. A further 11 types are classified as carcinogenic, and they're types 31, 33, 35, 39, 45, 51, 52, 56, 58, and 59. Um, probably also, they say type 68. About 8.5% of women in the general population are estimated to harbour cervical HPV 16 or 18 infection at any given time. So who should be vaccinated? Well, anybody who's not vaccinated and who is sexually active is at risk of contracting HPV. So Gardasil 9 is, is registered for use in females aged 9 to 46 years of age, so up to their 46th birthday, and males aged 9 to 26, or up to their 27th birthday. Individuals who want to protect themselves against HPV can certainly talk to their doctor, obviously, about getting vaccinated, but the vaccine is funded for students in the first year of high school. And I think across Australia now, that's fairly consistent to being year seven. As of the 6th of February, 2023, people aged up to and including 25 years of age are now eligible to receive one dose of the HPV vaccine free of charge as part of the National Immunisation Programme if they have missed their vaccine in the school program. So these catch-up vaccines for adolescents and young adults um, are definitely supported by you in general practice. Obviously, the participating local council immunisation clinics, um, any of the other school program providers, and certainly um, primary health care clinics. So on um, that date, uh, there was a change to the program. It was a bit of a sudden change for us, but uh, as per usual, we're great health professionals and we have really learned to spin on a dime. So why did it change? So the program changed really on the base of a really quite a large volume of evidence that's emerged in recent years. And the government's expert advisory group, which is a TAGI, the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation, has reviewed that international evidence and determined that a single dose gives comparable protection to two doses of the vaccine. So the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, which is the PBAC, then endorsed the um, recommendations from ATAGI. So ATAGI's recommendations really aligned with those of the World Health Organization's strategic advisory group of experts on immunization which is called SAGE, S-A-G-E, as well as the United Kingdom's Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, which is the JCVI. So in April 2022, SAGE evaluated the evidence and concluded that a single dose of HPV vaccine delivers comparable protection to multi-dose schedules in immunocompetent people. And we'll talk about that shortly. So the UK is looking at implementing this single dose schedule um, in their 2023 to 2024 school year. Um, and so for, that, for them, that starts around about August this year. So we've beaten the UK in getting as up and running so quickly. So we talked about immunocompetence 
competent people receiving one dose. Well, the immune compromised people still need to receive three doses, regardless of the age um, they are. If they are immune compromised individuals, um, three doses it is at zero, two and six months. So this is why it's always so important to do that pre-vaccination screening before you give any vaccines to ensure that your individual is not immune compromised. Obviously, for anybody that receives this vaccine after they have had their 26th birthday, then once again, it does fall back to a three-dose schedule at this particular current time. Okay, we've got our first poll. We're going to give you about 30 seconds or so to switch in an answer real quick. So what is the minimum acceptable interval in a three-dose HPV vaccine dose schedule? Is it three weeks between dose one and two and 16 weeks between doses two and three? Is it four weeks between dose one and two and 20 weeks between two and three? three weeks between doses one and two and 16 weeks between dose two and three? Or is it four weeks between dose one and two and 12 weeks between dose two and three? So without your handbook next to you, this could be a bit challenging. So we'll see how you go. We'll give you a few more, few more seconds. Okay, another another five seconds. Okay, let's see the results. Oh, look at that. So we've got a little bit of a spread across the board. Okay, all right. So because we were talking about what's the accepted minimum interval, um, the answer is actually D. So the minimum acceptable interval for HPV vaccines in a three-dose schedule is four weeks between doses one and two, and then 12 weeks between doses two and three. But there is a minimum interval of five months required between doses one and three. Always remember that if scheduled doses have been missed, Earlier doses do not need to be repeated if there's evidence that they have received doses before. Any missed doses, of course, should be given as soon as practical, observing the required minimum intervals. So the recommended schedule, so this is the minimum acceptable intervals, but the recommended schedule, of course, is an interval of two months between doses one and two and four months between dose two and three. So very good without having your handbook next to you. Okay, so who should be vaccinated? So studies have definitely shown that HPV infection among men who have sex with men um, or MSM is the primary risk factor for anal cancer. Um, and it is a condition, unfortunately, among MSM that exceeds the prevalence of cervical cancer in women. So in contrast to cervical HPV infection in women, which decreases with age, um, the prevalence of HPV infection in these particular men remains high at around about 57% across all age groups. So ATAGI do not specify an upper age limit for their recommendations when vaccinating men who have sex with men. Ultimately, the decision to vaccinate will be at the clinical discretion of the healthcare professional um, as it is considered off-label, um, but they can be vaccinated. 
Um, there are data available from clinical trials assessing the immunogenicity and safety of Gardasil 9 in adult males aged 26 to 45 years. And in other jurisdictions outside of Australia, Gardasil 9 is licensed for administration in adults up to the age of 45. Um, for male and female. So we'll just have to wait and see um, if Australia changes this, recommend, this recommendation for us in the future. So persistent recurrent disease occurs in around about 5 to 15% of women treated for high-grade um, squamous abnormalities. And moreover, these women are at higher risk of cervical cancer compared with the general population, even after adequate treatment. So it's important for these women also to receive HPV vaccine. Chronic immunosuppression for various reasons is an important risk factor for persistent infections with HPV and um, certainly for HPV associated disease. And because the immune system uh, response is likely to be lower, in immunocompromised people than healthy people. That's why there's a three dose schedule recommended for them. Um, significant immunocompromising conditions would include things like um, primary and secondary immunodeficiencies, um, H, um, IV infection, malignancies, uh, organ transplantation or significant um, immunosuppressive therapies. Um, interestingly, people with asplenia or hyposplenia are not considered at higher risk of persistent HPV infection and disease, and therefore just can receive a single dose schedule if they meet that age requirement um, of nine to 25 years of age. So a little bit, um, you know, completely different to pneumococcal disease where obviously asplenia or hyposplenia is a, a huge risk factor. So we've got our second poll already. So we're going to keep you busy with those fingers. So I'm going to give you about another 30 seconds or so. So is the routine vaccination recommended for all adults 26 years and older? No, because they're likely to have already been exposed to one or more HPV types through sexual activity or B, Yes, all adults should be routinely vaccinated with HPV vaccine. The third one, no, routine vaccination should be started at 17 years of age. Or the last one, yes, adults can be given an oral dose or an intramuscular dose of HPV. We'll see how you go. We'll give you another 10 seconds. Five more. Okay, let's see what the results show us. Haha. -ha. Oh, yes, you're a very, very smart audience. So, yes, the answer is A, because we're talking about routine vaccination. So, adults aged, um, you know, greater than 26 years aren't routinely recommended to receive HPV vaccine, mainly because adults are uh, likely to have been exposed to one or more HPV types contained in the vaccine through sexual activity previously. However, some adults will still benefit from HPV vaccination. So when deciding whether to vaccinate adults, um, certainly consider the likelihood of previous exposure to HPVs um, the risk of HPV in the future for this particular individual. And remember, it's highly unlikely that an individual will have been exposed to all of the HPV types in the vaccine. So there is benefit still for vaccinating that individual, absolutely. So vaccination does not clear a past infection of HPV, but it certainly can provide protection against future infections. So if they did choose to be vaccinated over 26 years of age, of course, you'd be defaulting to that three dose schedule.
So we have two inactivated HPV vaccines. Um, in 2006, the Therapeutic Goods Administration or the TGA approved Gardasil. Um, and only a year later, Australia became the first country that rolled out a national HPV vaccination program using the four valent HPV Gardasil vaccine. Um, and now, like I said, we've beaten the UK in introducing the single dose vaccine schedule. Um, we're certainly world leaders in this vaccine and uh, the initial program was marketed as a cervical cancer vaccine and therefore only females um, in adolescents were, were eligible. Um, there was that catch-up program for women up to 26 years of age back in the day, um, but that sort of ended on in the middle of 2009. So it's really important to check the AIR um, to seek immunisation history for um, anybody that's presenting for HPV vaccine. So either check the AIR, definitely, um, or certainly quiz quiz your patient and, and see whether they've already had doses before. Um, teenage boys became eligible for the program in 2013. Obviously, we've got a two-valent um, vaccine called Cervarix. It only protects against uh, types 16 and 18, obviously only therefore registered for the use in females, and it's available on private script. Okay, so... Like I said, uh, type 16 and 18 uh, um, is the protection that Cervix can offer. Gardasil 9 obviously offers um, greater protection against nine different strains of HPV. Um, and these are the ones that cause about 90% of cervical cancers um, in women and around 90% of other HPV-related cancers in both men and women. Um, and, of course, Gardasil also protects against serotype 6 and 11, which are most responsible for genital warts. So Gardasil 9 is the one, that obviously, that you've been working with with uh, the funded program in the school system, and that is the one that you'll be working with for anybody up to their 26th birthday that has missed their school program vaccine. So this single dose schedule offered in the first year of high school, definitely with the aim to vaccinate them before they become sexually active. So you'd be thinking in year seven, you probably be catching them prior to their, um, their onset of sexual activity, fingers crossed. Um, but certainly um, if they do anyone that misses their dose at school, certainly you've got that opportunity now to catch them up until they're 26. So who should not receive HPV vaccine? Clinical trials and, and you know, certainly um, limited data from observational studies where HPV vaccine was inadvertently given to um, pregnant women indicate really that there's no increased risk of adverse events to the fetus. However, um, HPV is not, uh, vaccine is not recommended in pregnancy. Um, if somebody, um, you know, was to become pregnant straight away after having their, their dose of vaccine, it's, it's not of concern. If the woman gets pregnant halfway through her three dose course, if she's over 26 years of age, then uh, it's just recommended to stop the course and complete it once she's had the baby. And of course, with any vaccine, if somebody's had an, an anaphylactic reaction to this vaccine previously, <laughs> yeah, you'd certainly not be giving it for sure. Okay, so our third poll for the night. When can women who wish to conceive following a course of HBV vaccine commence trying to fall pregnant? So we'll just give you 15 seconds. I think you will be able to nail this one nice and quickly because you've done so well and you've listened so well. Okay, immediately after their last dose is the vaccine is not a live virus vaccine. Four weeks after their last dose, one week after their last dose, or immediately after their last dose is the vaccine is a, is a live virus, but won't affect the fetus. 
I think you will have nailed this by now. So let's see. Are we ready for some results? Absolutely. They can try as soon as they've had the vaccine. They, they do not need to wait any amount of time at all. It's not a live virus vaccine. Um, so they can fall pregnant as quickly as they wish to. So other measures, we talked before about the cervical screening, um, which aims to detect that presence of HPV and if needed, therefore, um, treatment for precancerous abnormalities can be initiated um, to stop them becoming, um, you know, progressing to cervical cancer. Um, cervical cancers detected through cervical screening have shown to lower the risk of causing death by about 77%. So we really must encourage vaccination and screening as these are the most effective strategies in reducing cervical cancer. And all cervical cancer um, screening participants now have a choice of a self-collection. Um, so they that can be facilitated through their GP, of course, and you've probably seen some women already coming in um, and asking about that self-collection. So we can see that women who were vaccinated against HPV when they were younger really are much less likely to be needing treatment for pre-cancer or cancer during their lifetimes. And this vaccine protecting both men and women from acquiring genital warts as well. It's a fabulous vaccine and it's definitely been an, a very, very effective vaccine. So vaccine effectiveness um, as a single dose versus multiple doses, um, this Kenyan study included um, just over 2,000 women. Um, they were randomly assigned um, and, and followed up. So about, um, about half of them, so about yeah, 760, received the nine-valent HPV vaccine in the study. The others received the bivalent or the two-valent HPV vaccine and around about 760 of them, again, um, received meningococcal vaccine. And certainly the results from this were very, very positive in demonstrating that vaccine effectiveness um, was exceptionally high, 97.5% um, in those that uh, received HPV vaccine. There's been other studies as well as the Kenyan study um, that have been conducted. And there's been a systematic review conducted by the Cochrane Response for the World Health Organization just in um, January, 2022. And they found that there was a high certainty evidence that one, two or three doses of HPV vaccine resulted in similarly high rates of seropositivity to HPV 16 and 18, and that this was sustained up to 11 years. And found in that randomised control trial in Kenya, there was a large reduction in persistent HPV infections following one dose of either Gardasil 9 or the Cerberix vaccine. So there's plenty of evidence that tells us that a single dose is all that is needed. Obviously, um, hugely successful program. Um, and by reducing the number of infections through vaccination is certainly going to reduce the amount of high grade cervical abnormalities and therefore reduce the number of cervical cancer cases and deaths. According to Cancer Australia, um, there were an estimated you know, 942 new cases of cervical cancer diagnosed in Australia um, in 2022 and an estimated 222 deaths from cervical cancer in 2022. And this is slightly less than what there was noted in 2018. Um, if there is some expectation that the incidence rate for cervical cancer will increase with age, 
um, highest for those around 45 to 49 years. But then we should start seeing that rate decreasing as our vaccinated cohort um, age. So can we do better? Heck yes, yes we can. If we can improve the uptake in the school program, and now with that opportunity to vaccinate individuals up until their 26th birthday with one dose, a single dose, we can further reduce disease incidence. And perhaps you might be able to consider tar tar a targeted campaign in your practice, um, maybe in August once flu season settles down a little bit. Um, but definitely it's currently unknown if immunity following HPV vaccine is lifelong. However, current data supports a persistent stable antibody level after an initial plateau over many years. So long-term population-based follow-up studies to assess um, you know, how long this vaccine is going to protect people is certainly underway. Um, but if we can achieve 90% coverage with HPV vaccine, then Australia will be the first country to uh, eliminate cervical cancer if it hits its target um, at 2035. So just over 10 years away, we are hoping that we will have eliminated this disease in Australia. So this speaks for itself. You know, definitely there is a mortality rate. Um, we know that it is going to improve the more we can vaccinate people and the more people that get tested through that surgical screening program. Safety, of course, we always talk about. We know that HPV vaccines are well tolerated. Um, obviously, um, adverse event rates following the four-valent Gardasil, the original Gardasil administration in Australia, were really consistent with data from similar surveillance systems internationally and, and did not really reveal any new or concerning safety issues. Obviously, fainting can occur. Um, it's, it's not just HPV vaccination. It's just generally associated with vaccination um, anyway. Um, Anxiety-related reactions, um, that has happened, but just really sit them down, calm them down, lay them down if you need to um, and vaccinate them. And particularly if they're a known fainter, always lay them down and vaccinate them uh, either on a bed or on the floor. But pretty common side effects generally as per any other vaccine. Obviously, there was some talk around HPV infertility. Um, there is just no biologically plausible way in which this the vaccine can cause infertility in either men or women. Studies of high doses of the vaccine in female and male rats showed no effect on fertility. And ongoing review of vaccine in humans has not shown any evidence that HPV vaccination is linked to fertility. Some websites um, aimed at disrupting vaccine programs and vaccine confidence claimed that polysorbate 80, which is um, a, um, a part of, you know, it is, it is, it is in Yagardasil 9, um, it is a component. Um, they claim that that alone causes infertility in rats. Um, but that was really based on one study of newborn rats um, that just weighed, you know, 10 to 17 grams, given extremely large doses, 20 to 200 times the amount um, in Gardasil injected into the abdomen. So the TGAs reviewed all of the available data and concluded that there's no evidence that the amount of polysorbate 80 and HPV vaccines poses a risk to fertility. And polysorbate 80 is a common ingredient in other medications, cosmetics and foods, including your ice cream, because polysorbate 80 is added to make the ice cream smoother and easier to handle, as well as increasing its resistance to melting. So polysorbate is something that we are very well accustomed to. Um, 
autoimmune diseases, obviously adjuvants are substances added to vaccines to improve the immune response to um, the part of the vaccine that mimics the pathogen. And of course, um, aluminium containing adjuvants have been around for more than 50 years, um, widely used in human va um, vaccines. So aluminium, once again, third most abundant element after oxygen and silicon. And it is the most abundant metal making up almost 9% of the earth's crust. So aluminium is found in plants, soil, water and air. Typically, adults will ingest about seven to nine milligrams of aluminium a day. Infants ingest aluminium through breast milk, uh, milk formula, soy formulas, um, in addition to their diet once they do get onto solids. So there's just no evidence at all that aluminium in vaccines results in serious or long-term adverse events, including autoimmune diseases. So what about premature ovarian failure or POF, uh, postural tachycardia syndrome, POTS, or complex regional pain syndrome? So obviously POF, also known as premature menopause, occurs when the menstrual cycle ceases before the age of 40. And in up to 90% of cases, the cause is actually unknown. And when comparing vaccinated girls who have presented with POF-like symptoms with the background rate of POF, there is no evidence of an increased um, rate at all or a proven link to the vaccine. Your complex regional pain syndrome includes chronic pain, typically following often a minor injury or trauma, and your postural um, orthostatic tachycardia syndrome involves um, substantial sustained increase in heart rate when moving from lying to sitting. Um, both of these conditions are thought to be caused by a variety of known and unknown factors and are diagnostically challenging with onset difficult to determine and symptoms will often overlap with um, other conditions. And there's just no evidence that these vaccines um, trigger those conditions. So very, very quickly here, our conclusions there is no perfect treatment for HPV infection. Not everyone requires treatment if they did get a HPV infection. The best thing that we can possibly do is recommend and encourage HPV vaccination, especially in those HPV naive individuals, those young teens. Um, continue to recommend cervical screening and send out those recalls to women who are due for their screening. So making sure that every dose is reported to the AIR so one provider can check it out and know exactly what it's had, what that individual has had. So definitely a single dose now, um, HPV vaccine safe and well tolerated. And I really thank you for listening to the webinar. I hope you found it um, informative. And what, like I said, I hope you're walking away with just one new piece of information tonight. So thank you very much. And Angela, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for a, a fabulous tour through the information, background, and also challenges in relation to human papilloma virus and its prevention and its um, uh, management. And indeed, such a crucial subject um, for us as practitioners, but for our patients and uh, for our communities and populations. So uh, thank you so much and for making it so clear and so interesting. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. And, and thank you um, to, um, uh, to everyone who's been uh, listening in and um, has submitted um, questions. So I do have some questions for Angela. So Angela can't just um, uh, um, uh, head home straight away. Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to ask, <laughs> ask some questions. So um, are you braced for questions, Angela? Absolutely. I will do my best to answer them. Okay. And um, I'm going to keep these anonymous, so I'm not going to um, disclose the uh, the names of the um, uh, questioners. Um, so the question here is a fascinating question. Can the other warts on a finger cause genital warts and hence throat cancer? So, so warts on a finger, plain warts. Right, plain warts on a finger um, really shouldn't cause um, a genital wart because the HPV pipes 
there are mucosal types of HPVs as well as the other types. So to my understanding, um, there would be, um, I would have insufficient intelligence, I think, to answer that 100,000%. But um, being a mucosal HPV, um, Andrew, you may shed some more light on on warts on a finger, but um, I no, think the risk I'm, would be I'm, low. I'm afraid I, I'm, I'm ignorant. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, certainly mm. not, I'm not aware of any sort of association, um, uh, but uh, no. warts. So um, I guess it's possible, yeah. Um, yeah. but I'll have to do some homework mm. on that. So maybe we'd all have mm. to do some work um, on that. So thanks, Angela. In fact, the next question is a corollary of that. It's um, the, the question is, um, we might be on firmer ground here, is which variants are most commonly um, associated with um, throat or anal cancers? And I think you alluded to that in your, your presentation. Um, yeah, look, there is quite a, quite a long list of those particular cancers, um, those particular HPVs, and I could go back through some of my notes here and find that particular slide. But we certainly did uh, talk about the main cancers. So here we go. So the most high risk cancers, um, are, of course, are 16 and 18. But the others are types 31, 33, 35, 45, 52, and 58 are known as to be the highest risk. But there are 40 HPV types that specifically infect the anogenital tract. Okay. Thank you, Angela. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's very helpful. Um, and again, we're sort of, sort of following one question on to the next. This is... Um, in regard to the vaccine um, and prevention of genital warts. So how, how does the HPV vaccine prevent genital warts when the strains are so different? Um, uh... <laughs> Look, you know, the, the vaccine technologies that are used, and if you can think about any other vaccine that has multiple serotypes, you know, you can think about meningococcal serotypes, A, C, W, and Y. You can think about the serotypes of Pneumococcal, so we've got 23 different serotypes in a Pneumovax 23, 13 different serotypes of pneumococcal in Prevnar 13. HPV vaccines really are exactly the same. They specifically target those specific serotypes. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, without sort of probably... Um, having a very long lecture around how they produce vaccines, cool. it's probably the easiest way to say that the vaccine will target that particular serotype genome, the same as other vaccines that have multiple serotypes. Thanks, um, Angela. Yeah, that, um, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm going to move on to another question, and uh, we're just about to close up because we've um, sort of hit the seven o'clock mark, but uh, um, the uh, question I would like to, to ask, um, and you referred to papillomatosis in uh, um, uh, newborns, and it seemed to be quite an horrific um, uh, illness. Um, so the, the, the question that's been asked, are pregnant women who have genital warts, are they aware of their risks to the newborn? Um, and uh, are there obstetricians offering them uh, caesarean section as they might do with um, uh, um, uh, herpes simplex um, virus? And look, you know, that's a that's a great question. And I don't work in the obstetrics field, but I would certainly, I would certainly be hoping that that conversation would happen um, with the obstetrician if if that woman did have um, genital warts, most definitely. I would hope that conversation would happen. Mm -hmm. You know, the condition is very rare. Mm -hmm. um, most babies can be born quite safely. Um, and, and not acquire, um, you know, that particular disorder, but the risk is there. So yeah. they would, I would certainly hope the obstetricians would be talking about that risk. Yeah. And do we know how much um, risk? Is it sort of one in a thousand risk for a woman with genital warts or is it one in a hundred or one in ten? Yeah, I'm not actually, I can't answer that. Um, yeah. I would have to take that one unnoticed, but... Um, 
it it it, it just always is written as it's a rare sure. yeah. it's a it's mm -hmm. a rare occurrence that it happens yeah. but it's good that it should be highlighted and discussed and uh, that's really important mm. these, these questions are giving us quite a bit of homework Angela yes they are so they're uh, fantastic yeah. questions <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, um, I, I think we did cover this or touched on this during the presentation. It's about contraindications to HPV yes. vaccination. So um, uh, what, what, are, what are the contraindications, um, Angela? So really, the, the true contraindication is anaphylaxis to a previous dose. That's really it. Yeah. And we just don't offer this vaccine in pregnancy. Um, yeah. Like I said, you know, inadvertently it has been given to pregnant yeah. women. There's been no adverse event, um, effects on the fetus at all. But mostly um, we would, yeah, just as a precaution, not, not give it to pregnant women. Cool. Yeah. So, um, look, let me just round off with um, a question which follows on from our question about the uh, genital warts in pregnancy. Um, so if we're talking about the risk to the baby, is it the wart that's the risk? Or is it the fact that um, it's cerv cervical HPV? Is that the risk for the newborn? So, uh... yeah, look, it's just the fact that the that that particular virus is there um, in mm. in the in the pregnancy and being a mucosal um, virus, the baby being born through that, the, the risk is is just there because there's a there's that viral risk. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. And uh, I'll turn the tables, Angela. Have you got any questions for um, uh, uh, the group to think about as, the, as we uh, as we leave? And anything that we should be pondering? The the one thing that I would probably really ask for every single person, and I know you're about to get super, 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 super busy with flu season, is just to really think about doing um, a little bit of a search with your databases in your practices and identify anybody that has missed their cervical cancer you know, um, screening, but certainly also if they have not yet received a dose of Gardasil vaccine. Um, and, you know, hopefully if you can do a little bit of a targeted activity, you know, even if it's after flu season would be fantastic. We just need to get this vaccine into people's arms. Even every little bit helps. So what a fabulous take home message for us to sort of ponder on and look at how we can actually implement that, because it's all great to have an idea, but um, we in practice have to actually put it in place. And yeah. as we've already alluded to uh, a flu season, which is probably going to um, uh, step step out and, uh, and get itself in the way. Angela, thank you so much for a, a wonderful evening. Um, uh, thank you for, uh, say, all the um, uh, information and, uh, um, uh, as I say, all the background that you've helped us um, with. Thank you very much for answering our questions. My pleasure. Very curly, challenging um, questions. And thank you to our audience. Thank you so much for um, uh, being with us this evening um, uh, and for participating through your, um, uh, your questions. And I hope that you've um, been able to uh, learn um, something um, uh, helpful um, for your practice as well. And I would be fairly sure you will. So our next webinar um, is Influenza in Australia. And it's three weeks today on March the 29th. And our presenter is Angela. So Angela will be, uh, um, did you know that, Angela? <laughs> yes, she did. <laughs> yes, I, yes, I did. So uh, isn't the audience just so lucky to hear me <laughs> twice in a month? <laughs> so fabulous. So we'll look forward to seeing Angela back, uh, back, which will be wearing a different hat this time. She'll be uh, wearing the, she's already made a plug for influenza, so she's got a nice lead on to um, uh, the, uh, the, next, uh, the next session. Um, so uh, subscribe, please, to the Immunisation Coalition newsletter um, for more information. There'll be a survey coming through after the event closes. It'd be really great if you complete this. It helps us with our professional development and with our um, uh, continuing quality improvement as well. So it just remains to me to uh, thank everyone and uh, to wish you very well and to have a lovely evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, thank you, Andrew. Thanks. Thank you.